thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Carl Bergstrom from the UW Biology Department, who's going to talk about something a little unusual for the CSE colloquium, and that's dealing with deception in biology. I can't believe this is a real bug, but hopefully we'll learn more about them. So Carl, thanks for being here today. All right, thanks a lot, Ed. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, rather than talking about some things in CS where you would know a lot more than me and I'd look stupid, I'm going to talk about things in biology where you know about as much as me and it'll be a draw. So um, what I want to do, I'm a theorist, so that's, so what I, what I, want, to, what I want to do is talk about this problem of, of deception in biology. And I want to start out by kind of trying to give you some context of why deception is so tremendously important um, as a problem that biology, that evolution has had to solve. Um, and to do that, and in, in my talk in general, I'm going to be drawing heavily on the ideas of one particular man, John Maynard Smith. John was a phenomenal evolutionary biologist who's been a tremendous inspiration to me. He brought uh, game theory into, into biology, into evolutionary biology, um, and, uh, and more later in his life laid out what I think was, uh, you know, outline of the research program for where evolutionary biologists should be going in trying to understand how the wonders and complexity of the biological world that surround us have gotten to be here. So I'll talk about that a bit more, but I just want to say, you know, most of the good stuff in this talk is John's stuff, and, and, um, and I want you to just hear about it, because and, and, it's awesome, and, and, and I miss him. Um, okay, so as, as John was very fond of saying, you know, the first thing to recognize is that evolution, there's nothing in evolutionary theory that, that implies that, um, that, that we should see any kind of progress, that the world should become more and more complex. John was very uh, fond of pointing out that crocodiles haven't done bugger all since the Cretaceous, and that horsetails haven't done bugger all for longer than that. And, and, um, and so, you know, there, there's no reason why things have to get more, have to change, have to get more complex in evolutionary theory, and yet if we look at the history of life on Earth, we actually end up seeing you know, what I think is one of the most staggering um, uh, stories of, of growth and innovation and progress and change that it's, it's got to be the most uh, spectacular one we know about on this universe. So to just kind of zip through the story, um, you know, uh, um, uh, four and a half billion years ago, the, the uh, Earth formed by accretion um, begins to cool off. Um, nothing happens for a billion years, but after, well, things cool down and some chemistry and stuff, but nothing cool happens for <laughs> a billion years. Um, and then, uh, but after a billion years, the first prokaryotic life emerges. Pace of things is pretty slow, but by, you know, but, but after another uh, 500 million years, um, so, so now three billion years ago, we get the first cyanobacteria, start to photosynthesize, they produce oxygen, change the nature of the atmosphere. By two, a little bit over two billion years ago, the first unicellular eukaryotes are arising. Um, still all life is single cellular. Uh, it's only a billion years ago, a little over a billion years ago, that the first multicellular creatures appear on the planet. Uh, this is not them, but these are Volvox, which, uh, they may, they, which are very, very simple current multicellulars. Um, no, Things don't get really cool until about 580 million years ago. We have the Avalon explosion, produces the Ediacara and fauna, which are all of these weird, strange, giant multicellulars with very different body plans from the majority of what we see now. Most of that then dies out in the Cambrian explosion, where a whole new set of body plans is produced that are completely different um, than, than the ones, for the most part, in the Ediacaran. But essentially, all present body plans alive are produced during this period 500 million years ago. 400 million years ago, we see the first land plants starting to arise. Um, 140 million years ago, you get the evolution of flowering plants, and they start co-evolving with insect and, and other kinds of animal pollinators. Um, seven million years ago, we get the first hominids. Uh, two million years ago, or, or, or point to 200,000 years ago, the Homo sapiens, early Homo sapiens arises. Um, 10,000 years ago, we get riding in agriculture, and you, see, just, you can see the acceleration that's going on here. 250 years ago, the Industrial Revolution. 20 years ago, the internets. And, um, and I mean, wow, this is spectacular stuff, I think. This is, this is incredible, right? This is this, is this acceleration of, 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 of complexity and, and information transfer and all of this. And, 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 and we can measure this, we can try to measure this in various ways. We don't have to be so, um, you know, we don't have to just do it poetically, if you will. Uh, we can look at growth in body size over time. So, you know, on this 
log scale, things get bigger and bigger and bigger over the history of life and the biggest things that have ever lived are living now and, and so on. We can look at the growth of morphological complexity, how many cell types are there. Again, things get more and more complicated over evolutionary time. We can look at biodiversity. We get more and more species in, um, on, er, on, on the land, in the, in the oceans over time. So we see this buildup, this progression. And what we want to know, you know, in the absence of an evolutionary theory that predicts a progressiveness or, or, or an increase in complexity, you know, what, what made all of this possible? And John Maynard Smith's fundamental thesis is that a lot of what drove all of this buildup of complexity is advances in information technology. And he wrote a pair of books with the Earth's Athmary um, where he lays out this story, he looks at these major transitions, these changes in the way that living things deal with information, acquire it, store it, process it, transmit it over the history of life on Earth and how that's changed the, 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 the this, this fundamental structure, the rules by which life is formed and built and evolved. Um, this one's really hard and now out of date. This is one of the best books I've ever seen. So if anybody's ever you know, interested, it's about 100 pages long and it's written for a semi-popular audience and just lays out this story beautifully. So a little, um, little suggestion if someone's curious about anything that I happen to talk about. So the, you know, the basic story, the basic reason that, that, that John gives us for why we see this buildup of complexity over time is that over and over and over again, at many stages, at many scales, we see something like the following process happen. We have these previously independent individuals, things that replicate by themselves. Uh, they could be, you know, they could be uh, uh, RNA molecules in some kind of prebiotic soup. They could be little unicellular creatures. Uh, they could be, um, they could be simple multicellular creatures. And they join together in some kind of way. And these new individuals, and forming this new level of individuality, right? So we're taking multiple small things, joining these together in a larger form. And these larger forms now have a number of advantages. They can benefit from economies of scale. They can benefit from division of labor. In particular, they can benefit from information exchange. And if you sort of look at the structure of human biology or the structure of just about anything in biology, you'll be able to recognize these, 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 these uh, you know, aggreg aggregates on top aggregates on top aggregates on top aggregates, right? So, um, so you know, Mayor Smith thinks that you know, this process happening repeatedly is built up this, is, is what we're seeing. It's building up this enormous complexity and a huge driver of this, according to John, and, and, I, and I'm you know, completely with him here, um, is the way that information works in the world. And I think maybe the clearest way to explain, you know, why is information such a big driver of aggregation is to look at how the sort of stoichiometry of information is different than the stoichiometry of other physical resources. And so George Bernard Shaw is, is reported to have said, if you have an apple and I have an apple and we exchange apples, then you and I will each still have one apple. But if you have an idea and I have an idea and we exchange ideas, then each of us will have two ideas. Now I gave a talk about this to a bunch of lawyers and business people and they hated the idea that they were getting lectured about sharing from a celebrated socialist. <laughs> so I went back to the books. Maybe someone can tell me where this is from. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine as one who lights his taper at mine receives a light without darkening me. Nature made ideas like fire expansible all over space without lessening their density at any point. So we can, we can go to kind of more all-American figures if we want to, and this same sentiment is still there in the literature, right? Um, this, I, this is a fundamentally important point, I think, is that, is, that, is that aggregates can share information in a way that they cannot share resources. If we form an aggregate and we've each got our dinner we don't, and we share it, well, of course, we only have single dinners. If we, if we come in here and we do what we're doing now, and we do it repeatedly, it, we just get this buildup of information in the, in, in the collective. And, and that, that kind of fundamentally different stoichiometry of information, I think, is absolutely critical to why we see biology getting more and more complicated and increasing in scale and increasing in information capacity over evolutionary time. So, so that's, you know, that's the reason we're, we're going to care. But you, know, if you, you guys, if you know the literature, you know that where there are apples in a story, there are going to be serpents. And, um, and so the serpent in our particular garden is deception. Um, 
if, uh, you know, I told you this, this great story about, about how information is this wonderful, wonderful stuff that I can give to Ed for free, and he's sort of assuming that I'm not bullshitting him. Yeah, so, so this is this big problem, right, is that, is, you know, I can communicate with you guys, um, but, so, but, but, but that sort of assumes, it presumes that you have some reason to believe me and I'm not using it as a way to manipulate you. And there's this whole theory within evolutionary biology that in fact maybe there's no such thing as animal communication at all. It's just, it's Ed's first trying to mind read me. He's trying to, uh, he's, he's, he's trying to just guess what I'm going to do from subtle cues I'm giving. And then I learned that by giving subtle cues I can influence Ed and we get into this arms race and there's no real communication at all. So is it, you know, is, is communication this, this lovely socialist thing or is it just, pure manipulation. In other words, how are we going to deal with this threat and problem of deception and manipulation in that way? So that's what I want to talk about today. How is it that biological systems deal with deception um, at a couple of different levels? And I want, to, I want to make a distinction between two different levels where biological societies, it may be a society of cells or a society of organisms, have to deal with deception. One issue is how do we deal with deception among members of a society, legitimate society members uh, that have incentives to deceive one another. We'll talk about that. And then what do we do about deception by rogue outsiders? What do we do about um, sort of uh, various kinds of spoofing and hacking and phishing and man in the middle attacks? How can we deal with those kinds of deceptive challenges? So I'm going to take these in turn. That's sort of where I'm going for the rest of the lecture. And let's just start out with with, uh, you know, deterring deception by society members, right? So this is a problem that we have to solve in our social institutions all the time. And commerce relies on it, right? So I was thinking the other day that it would be very, very nice. Um, it, Darwin wrote about the things I'm talking about today, and I thought, you know, boy, it would be really nice to own a first edition of this, Descent to Man in Relation to Sex. And so I could actually, you know, I, this is out of, out of, I'm priced out, as it turns out, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, um, but, but I could actually go on the internet and here's someone somewhere that I've never met, never will meet, and I can give this person, um, I don't want to tell you how many months of a biology professor's salary, in order to, um, <laughs> in, in, in exchange for a copy of this book, and I could do it quite safely because of a set of legal institutions, reputational uh, metrics that are put in place, and so on. Somehow we've dealt with the fact that, you know, this guy would have an incentive to deceive me and tell me that he's got a first edition when really it's a cheap knockoff or it's a, it's a copy of the latest Stephen King book or, or whatever, right? Um, somehow human societies have dealt with that, and there are these partially overlapping interests I have between a potential seller. It's not that he and I are best friends forever and we have the same common interests, it's just that if we can somehow deal with each of our private incentives to cheat one another, then we're going to all be in a position, we're going to both be in a position where we can reap the benefits of trade. And this is what they'll tell you at Chicago School is what's so great about free markets and so on. <laughs> so, um, okay, okay. So, right, so we get partially, partially overlapping interests. What I want to talk about in this first half of the talk, basically, how can we communicate? How can I evolve honest communication with you given that we have only partially overlapping interests. And what does that mean? I mean what, what do I mean by that? Well, one way to think about that is to think about, um, you know, what happens every Christmas season. I go out boozing with the brother-in-law. And um, so you go out boozing with the brother-in-law, and the brother-in-law is perpetually in one of three states. You can kind of imagine the probability distribution over them. <laughs> he's either flat broke, mooching her usual, or every now and then he's cheated a grandmother out of her life savings, and he's, and he's Mr. High Roller, right? And um, so, so I never know when we go out which one of these states he's in. Um, but if we go out and he's flat broke, he wants me to pay, he ha I have to pay. Um, if he's mooching as usual, he wants me to pay. And, and if he's high roller, he wants everyone in there to know it. So, he, so then he, he wants to pay. Um, when I go out with him, well, if he's flat broke, I'll cover the guy. He's a decent guy. Um, you know, if he's mooching as usual, I just as soon let him pay. And if he's high roller, that's great, you know. So, <laughs> So now, now we've got this situation, we're trying to figure out, you know, where, where are we at? Is he going to pay? Am I going to pay? We need to communicate about this. And of course, um, you know, we've got, no, look, we've got a common interest if he's flat broke or high roller. Uh, but the problem is, and what's going to make it a little bit tricky getting a straight answer out of the guy, is if he's mooching as usual, now we've got conflicting interests, right? So, so this is the problem I face dealing with my brother-in-law every Christmas season. It's also the problem that a mother bird faces every time she lands at the edge of her nest. 
She lands at the edge of her nest. She's got four hungry chicks that have evolved by natural selection to try to get every damn bit of energy out of her that they possibly can, even somewhat at her expense. This is the whole biological theory of, of parent-offspring conflict, right? They'd rather just take her, they, they're selected to take her for everything they can. If they're really hungry, you know, if they're flat broke, she wants to feed them. If they're, and, and, and go out and get more, even though it's late and the owls are coming out and so on, right? Um, if, they're really, if, if, if they're really stuffed, they'll let her know. But if they're mooching as usual, and that's the perpetual state of these guys, then it's going to be hard for her to, you know, then she'd rather just call it a night, tuck in on the nest. They want her to just, you know, go ahead, take the chance, go on, go on. Don't worry about next year's brood and, and, and go find me another worm. And so the question is, how does honest communication evolve in a situation like that, right? So similar kind of problem. Think about your assigning grades to kids in the class. They're kids that deserve a C, kids deserve a B, kids deserve an A. You know, the, the, C, the, the, the A students want to be seen as A students, B students want to be seen as A students, C students want to be seen as A students, they'd even settle for B students. Um, but you want to see them for what they are, right? So, so what's the conflict? There? And common, so, but there's, there's still some common interest here. You've got a common interest with the A students of telling that they're A students and in fact discriminating them from the B students. You've got some common interest with the B students in discriminating them from the C students. And it turns out you don't have any common interest from the C students unless they're D students and, and so on. So, uh, so, you know, in a case like this, um, you do have, we've got partial coincidence of interest. You've got, it, you've got a coincident interest with some of the individuals not, not with the others. And how can you set up honest communication so that we can sort these apart? And this is the problem that, say, a female uh, spruce grouse will, sorry, uh, sage grouse will, will face when she lands at a lek of male birds. They're all trying to signal that they're, they're A quality birds. They've got low parasite loads and great genomes and the, and the whole deal. They'd all like to convince her of that, but she wants to see them for what they are. And how can, how can we have honest communication there? And, uh, sexual selection context. Well, I mean, one possibility is you're screwed. You can't do it. But as Maynard Smith and uh, Harper have pointed out, you know, if you go walking out in the woods, every, all of this sensory input that you have all around you is, is you know, it's the smells of the flowers and the sounds of the birds and the butterfly flying by and the flashing tail of the deer. All this stuff is evolved by natural selection to be signals. And, and Signals won't have evolved if they're not listened to. It'd be waste to send a signal that isn't listened to. And if signals aren't honest on average, you're not going to listen to them. So somehow all of these signals have evolved to be at least honest on average. And what we want to do is understand, you know, how has that happened? How has that worked? So um, there's this wonderful idea. Some of you may have heard it, um, or many of you may have heard it, I don't know. In biology, it's known as the handicap principle. Uh, and the handicap pr principle proposes one particular way that this kind of problem of honest communication under conflicting interests can be resolved. And what the handicap principle does that's so clever is, it, and this is Alma Shahavi's work, it takes two different ideas, uh, two different puzzles that, you know, Darwin writes about both of these as, as puzzles, and it realizes that they're both terribly puzzling on their own. And why is communication honest when there might be incentives to lie? Why are signals extravagant? Um, natural selection should be efficient, not have great big spectacular tails and enormous racks of antlers and flamboyant dances of, of birds of paradise and all of this stuff. And, and, and these two very puzzling problems um, actually take care of one another and annihilate if we propose that one is the answer to the other. Why is communication honest? Because it's extravagant. Why are signals extravagant? So that, you, so that they're um, stably honest. And so Jahavi, and I'll, I'll, I mean, that, that may seem like a stretch, I'll explain how it works in just a second, but I want to just do a little bit of history here first. Amat Jahavi proposes this idea in 1975. He does exactly what biologists have done, especially kind of social biologists have done, which is a lot of this. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, every, and, and, and no one can figure out what he's talking about. Everyone laughs at him, and there's a stream of papers from the rather, from the, from the um, you know, top theorists, including John Maynard Smith himself, saying this can't possibly work. Same year, well, year before, Michael Spence, a graduate student at Stanford, um, writes the, you know, ha has a very different attitude toward what to do with his hands. Um, Michael writes down very, very formally 
a simple mathematical model, a very simple mathematical caricature of this process. This is in the economic literature. He's looking at the question of why is it that you pay, uh, that employers pay salaries to people who have gone to college even though they didn't learn a damn thing of use to the employer there. So you go to college, you learn all this stuff, but it's not useful to the employer, and then you get a higher salary, what for having been to college? Why is this? And uh, so Spence, so Spence you know, uh, approaches the problem in that context, and, uh, and so instead of getting laughed at, he gets a Nobel Prize for his trouble. So kind of a little, <laughs> a little uh, um, kind of parable about, about mathematics. I don't need to tell you guys that, but it's great for biology <laughs> departments. As Ed and I were talking beforehand about this. Um, okay, so, so, so this is the history, but the basic idea, and I'm going to, you know, I'm, being a biologist, I'm going to stick with this guy, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you Jahavi's version of it, even though Spence wrote it down cleanly first. The basic idea is to try to think of communication as a game, as a game theoretic game. And so we've got a couple of players, we've got Alice and Bob, and the idea is that Alice has a bunch of private information about the state of the world, um, and what she can do is, is, is send a message over to Bob, who can then get this information, um, you know, transduce through Alice and take some actions in the world. And then the twist relative to your usual kind of Alice-Bob communication scenarios is that they have different interests, right? They've each got, you know, they're, they're different, their interests only partially overlap. And so we can take this game, we can write it down as a, you know, formal game theoretic game. You can write a game tree, um, you know, a little con construction from game theory. And, and so the kind of game tree story would work that, uh, um, Let's see, I guess my, I oh, don't need that. So again, the, story, the story would work essentially, nature chooses a move. Uh, nature chooses the state of the world, is the, sig is the signaler in high or low condition, high quality or low quality individuals say. The signaler chooses a signal, A or B. The receiver of the signal can, can, can tell the signal but can't tell what nature's original move was. So the receiver of the signal doesn't know whether you know, whether directly whether the world is high or low, but would, might try to aim to infer it from the signal. And what we're looking for is an equilibrium situation where, um, you know, at equal, and there's some, then everyone gets some payoffs depending on what the receiver decides to do, accept or reject the, the, the signal and so on. And, and so we're looking for an equilibrium situation where a high quality signaler uh, um, would, would send signal A and be accepted, whereas a low quality signaler would send signal B and and be rejected. So that information, you know, there's a bit of information in there, high or low, and that, inf and that bit of information is actually passed on to the receiver, despite the conflicting interests that it might be, you know, maybe every signaler wants to be seen as high quality. So you can do a whole bunch of mathematics here about how this kind of thing might work. Um, that gets kind of tedious and annoying, but you can capture about 90% of the intuition or 98% of the intuition or something with a very, very simple graphical model that I'll show you now. Um, so you think about, you know, how, let's think about how Jahavi's handicap principle works. Jahavi has handicap principle, you, as, as he stated, it says, you know, if signals are costly in the right way, then um, honesty can be enforced. And he had to do a lot of this about what in the right way was. But, but let, me, let, let, me, let me try to lay this out. So imagine that birds are making signals by have making, producing tails of, of different sizes, right? It's maybe more and more, and so this is a weaver bird, and maybe as you make bigger and bigger tails, it gets more and more costly. I mean, watching these things fly is, is, is very strange. They, they're, they're really, you know, their, their tail is four times as long as their body, and it really hampers them as they fly through the air. Um, yet, it's very sexy to have a long tail, frankly. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so there's a fitness gain to having a long tail, um, the bigger the tail, the bigger the fitness gain you get, you get the ladies. Um, but, the, um, but then there's costs, and those costs depend on your quality, right? If you're really big and strong, maybe you can carry a pretty big tail. If you're weak and have a lot of parasites, not so. So, you know, if you're a low-quality bird, maybe you have a cost function that looks something like this. You've got this fitness gain, you know, fitness cost. Evolution does some calculus for you, checks the second-order conditions, and says, okay, look, your tail should be this long. So you have a nice short tail like this. Um, you know, you can kind of see where this is going, get a bird, a medium bird can produce a big tail a little bit cheaper, so the optimal tail length is a little bit longer, and a, a high quality bird can have a somewhat cheaper tail yet, uh, and so get an even longer tail. And, and what we notice about this picture now, we've got an optimum, situ yeah, optimum situation, all of these guys are maximizing their differences between benefits and costs, and yet, um, you know, two things to notice here is that signals are honest, the high quality birds got the longest tail, the low quality bird, the shortest one, middle in the middle. 
And signals are costly. These birds are investing a substantial amount in production costs for their tails. So there, you know, this is kind of a graphical picture of Jahavi's story. In this case, we've got uh, a situation where there's sort of a constant gain. You get the same number of matings irrespective of your condition, but uh, uh, it, it only depends on your signal. Um, but we can turn the story around and we can look at a condition, with, but, but differential costs. We could also look at a situation where you have, um, where you have a, uh, um, a constant cost of producing the signal, but differential gains. And this brings us back to those begging birds. If you think about, the, you know, so what's the cost of begging? You attract predators to the nest and you waste some energy. What's the benefit to begging? Well, if you're starving, as in the yellow curve, you really, really need that food now. So the benefit of begging is very high. If you're, if you're hungry, then it's somewhat less high. If you're full, it's somewhat less. And again, you do the calculus or draw the lines and you, can, you set the slopes equal and you see that once again, we have, um, we have signaling that's both honest and costly in this kind of situation. So I just love this theory uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's clean, it's simple, we can understand it. And it seems to help us deal with that kind of a, um, a, a paradox. You know, why are signals honest? Why are they costly? And then we're left with this puzzle, which is that um, not all signals seem to be costly. So Sievert Rohr here at the UW uh, did some, in our department, did some wonderful work a number of years ago looking at the so-called badges of status on sparrows. So these two sparrows are sending signals by the size of the black chest patch. This one is sending a very subordinate signal. This one here, a very dominant signal because of the large black chest patch. The production cost of turning a few feathers black is very, very small. This is not having an appreciable, it's not like they're limited, highly limited in, in the availability of that pigment or something. This is, this is, this is a little, you know, this is just a little subtle thing. It could have gone either way, it doesn't matter. Um, so there really can't be costs substantial costs associated with producing a slightly bigger chest badge, and yet these badges appear to be very honest, reliable signals of dominance. In fact, you should start to worry, you know, about this whole argument about costly signaling and so forth if we're sitting here talking in language, because I can say I'm the toughest guy in the room, or I can say I'm the weakest guy in the room, and the sort of energetic cost of producing that is, is exactly the same. It's obviously the costs somehow aren't doing the aren't doing the job there, right? So how is it that we can make sense? And this may not be as much of a puzzle to, to you guys who weren't stuck in 25 years of thinking the wrong way about it, but how is it that, um, you know, how, how, how is it that we can have these honest signals without cost? Um, well, so imagine that we had signals that for one reason or another looked like this. They were, you know, a low guy can send a signal, it doesn't cost him anything until, unless he exaggerates his condition. And, uh, and the medium guy can send a signal, it doesn't cost him anything unless he exaggerates his condition. And, and similarly, the high guy sends a signal, doesn't cost him anything unless he exaggerates. Now in this case, we've got signals that are still honest, but, but now we don't have any cost. And so this, so you know, the first thing we notice from a picture like this is that the, the, the calculus conditions, um, you know, if we have a sharp enough curvature there or we have a uh, whatever, um, is that the theory, and you know, here this is, this is the part you guys didn't think about wrong for 25 years. The theory predicts it's not that signals aren't honest because of the, how much they cost. They're honest because of the marginal costs of exaggerating, right? And so when we think about this, we, now all we need to do is go back and try to understand, well, why is it that, signal, that signals might have costs that look like this? I mean, why, 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 would, why would costs possibly look like that? Well, when the cost of making a signal is on, sort of on the producer side, I'm going to make a signal, the cost I the cost that I pay for making that signal has to do with sort of the physical production of that signal. I'm going to tend to see, have these kinds of smoothly increasing curves that are, you know, they're not going to have sharp kinks. They're not going to have very, very sharp curvatures. And so indeed, uh, at equilibrium, my signal costs are likely to push up away from zero. But in cases like the signal and in cases like human speech, the, the, the costs of saying something false don't, for, for, the, for these chest badges, or for, or for what I'm saying now, those costs don't come from the producer side. They're not the cost of making the feathers or saying the words. It's the costs that are going to be imposed on the receiver side by people that, if, if I come and lie to you, you'll, there'll be some costs to me. And as it turns out, as, as Sievert found with his sparrows, when he, uh, you know, if, if he takes the sparrows and, and would blacken the breast of a bird using shoe polish, 
the other birds would defer to it for a few minutes and then they'd figure it out and then they'd beat it up terribly and he actually had to stop the experiments because the birds were beating, getting beaten up so badly. So once we have costs getting imposed not by production but rather by the receivers and the actions that they end up taking, now, the cost, now these costs can be imposed in a very, very context dependent way. We can get these kinds of curves and it makes sense to start thinking about uh, um, you know, signal costs that are, that are uh, you know, sort of signals that are, that are cost free to produce and cost free at equilibrium, but, but it's costs out of equilibrium that keep them honest. Shift the cost by bluffing, by having chutzpah, right? If that bird had been willing to act the part. Um, it, 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 if it had been willing to act the part, it would have done, it would have done well for longer. And the, the same damn thing happens with people, Ed. Exactly. It's yeah. a <laughs> right. Okay, so just yeah, no, I mean, yeah. it's just, it's just it's how long do they take to catch on? It's, right. And, and, yeah. Um, okay, so, so, so that's, that's kind of, this is, this is, biologists love this stuff. This is like, you know, this is how we make sense of signals. This is how we explain communication. But what I want to do is actually let you in on biology's dirty little secret. It's a pretty awful thing about all of this. And the really awful thing, so what I've done is I've showed you, you know, these pictures I've showed you correspond to mathematical demonstration that um, these signaling systems are equilibrium. These, these, are, these are equilibrium, a particular nice kind, evolutionary stable strategies of signaling games that we think about. Uh, and uh, so, so that's great. So we know that evolutionary stable strategies, once evolution gets there, it sort of stays there. They can't be invaded by types that do something different and so on. The really dirty secret uh, that we have in biology is that while these signaling equilibria are evolutionary stable strategies, you can't get there from here. Ye evolutionary dynamics, most of the evolutionary dynamics that we think about don't actually lead to signaling equilibria. They get stuck in so-called pooling traps or in, in various kinds of orbits. Um, and so here we've got, here we've just got, you know, it th doesn't really matter. You can think of these as evolution, as, as the you know, sort of evolutionary trajectories in a f phase plane that's representing different strategies of how to signal. Up there in the green corner is one of these proper signaling equilibria. Um, evolution by natural selection will follow this, will, will follow these trajectories as indicated here. And if it got, ever got up to the green corner, it would stay there and we'd have honest signaling. But what we see along this face is that we never get there. Instead, we cycle around or we get stuck at this red arrow here, a so-called pooling trap where there's no information produced. And so what biologists have discovered in the last couple of years, um, and, and that we've gotten very excited about in my lab, is that the standard evolutionary dynamics that we would think about of evolution by natural selection don't actually get to these lovely equilibria that allow us to make sense of all the animal communication out there. And so this leaves us with something really fun. It leaves us with an open problem. Evolution did it. Go out there and look. Evolution did it. There's all this costly signaling out there. There's all this honest signaling out there. How did it do it? How did it get there? What, what kind of evolutionary trajectories are occurring? What, what's missing from our basic evolutionary dynamics that that, that doesn't allow us to actually reach these signaling strategies. Um, well, you know, how do we avoid pooling traps? And so, neat, fun problems in, in, in pure evolutionary theory.
Okay, so what I want to do with the last bit of the talk is to then move from this problem of deception among the sort of legitimate members of a society and move to uh, thinking about how evolutionary systems deal with the threat of deception from rogue outsiders, right? And so, you know, going back to eBay, you know, I get an email like this and it tells me uh, I'm getting a question from an eBay member and, and, and wow, it's great, I might be able to sell my stuff, but if I look up here at the address, I actually see it's not coming from eBay. It is a little small, but it's not coming from eBay.com, it's coming from eBay Inc. Dot com. And in fact, if I click the link to go ahead and respond now, and I look up in my address bar, I don't actually hit eBay.com at all, but some IP address that I haven't really seen before. And in fact, I've, you know, of course, fallen for some kind of spoof email for some kind of phishing scam. Um, this, is a, this is sort of an uh, uh, attempt at deception, not by a legitimate participant, right? It's not the book dealer who I'm trying to trade with who's trying to screw me now. Now it's some man in the middle that's trying to inject in there and you know, not even part of the legitimate transaction that's trying to, that's trying to de deceive. And you know, again, we have various ways that we deal with this. I think you guys probably, or some of you, will know a tremendous amount more about that than I do and it would be awesome to hear more about that and, and talk about it. But, but basically what I want to ask is, you know, biology deals with all this all the time. I'll show you that in a second. And you know, basically go back to our signaling game and now add a third party. Let's add Eve here, who is eavesdropping or worse yet tampering with our, with our message. Now what do we do? Now what happens? How does evolution deal with that? And the place I turn to think about this is one of the fun places for me is to think about the evolution of the immune system. This is where we see a tremendous amount of this. The immune system's got to do this incredibly hard computation. It's got to be very sensitive and respond early to infection. It's got to have this incredible breadth of what it can do. It can respond to any kind of pathogen. It's got to learn what's self and non-self. So it's got all the immune learning going on. So there's this really serious computation here. Um, it's got to generate responses that are highly specific. When I eliminate chickenpox, I don't want to take out my liver as collateral damage. Uh, you've got to be able to take a response and amplify it very, very rapidly, right? So to kill pathogens, I mean, uh, you can have viruses that are that are producing 10 to the 14 variants per day. So you have these massive responses that are highly coordinated um, and, and regulated. And then ideally, you'd like to make good use of prior experience, and store that learned information in some kind of immunological memory. And so, you know, I put that up just to try to, in, in, in a few sentences, convince you that there's this marvelous computation that's going on, not only up here, but also in the, in the immune system of the body. Um, marvelous learning problem. And so we want to look at how the immune system does that, and we want to look at how it deals with two additional challenges. You know, part of the problem is you've got to avoid autoimmunity. You can't afford false positives. Of course, the immune system is constantly having false positives, but it's got mechanisms, safeguards in place that shut those down. Uh, that's why you're not constantly dealing from auto, with autoimmune disease. Um, but it's also got to avoid subversion. It's got to avoid being co-opted by the pathogens. Uh, and the, you know, pathogens can get in there, they're inside your body. They can mess with your, the control systems, the regulatory systems that are doing this computation. And they do. And the pox viruses are, are remarkable in, in, in this regard. They interfere with the chemokine signals, all the various immune signals that are used in the recognition and the regulation and, and, and control. Um, and they, you know, they make fake pro they make proteins that stimulate the receptors. They make, uh, they, they, chain, they get in the cells and change the production of various cell products. They, they make decoy receptors that mop, up the, uh, that, 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 that mop up the true signals. They make fake signals. They make things that slice up the signals. Sort of every bad trick you can think of, uh, they do that. And so it leaves the immune system with this very, very hard challenge. The immune system is trying to reduce damage from pathogens um, while simultaneously dealing with two goals, one of them auto avoiding autoimmunity, the other of them avoiding subversion. And these are fundamentally opposed in the sense that how do I avoid autoimmunity? I need ways of shutting down immune responses. What are pathogens trying to do? They're trying to shut down immune responses. And so how do, do immune systems manage to be able to shut themselves down but not let their pathogens evolve ways to shut themselves, to shut them down? And it's sort of the, the very challenging and, and, and kind of, you know, and uh, part of all of this is that uh, the pathogens are evolving approximately 100,000 times as fast as, as the uh, vertebrate hosts. You know, 
due to the difference in generation times and population sizes. So you've got to fight this adversary. You're in this arms race with an adversary that's, that's vastly faster. So how do you do it? And we can, so we can just start to try to talk and theorize and think a little bit and just make some patterns. And, and you know, one, thing that, one thing that comes to mind right away is that there are mechanisms that might provide robustness against any kind of problem. You've got this you know, control system or, or information processing system, and, and how's it going to deal with, uh, how's it going to deal with any kind of disruption? Well, you've got robustness mechanisms that we talk about in control engineering, control systems engineering or something. And in biology, these basically are mechanisms that would, you know, sort of preserve the phenotype or the function, despite variation in the inputs, despite noise, despite internal component failures, that kind of thing. So just kind of random interference. And then we have what we call strategic robustness, and strategic robustness would be mechanisms that do the same thing despite what I might refer to as directed attempts to sabotage the system. So in one case, I'm trying to set up a mission-critical um, uh, computer that can function on a satellite that's dealing with all of this um, you know, noise and other problems that might, and, and component failure and all these other problems. Uh, on the other hand, of course, I'm trying to set up a, a computer system that's going to function even though I know one of my five technicians is trying to sabotage it. Right, and so that's, these, are, these, are, these are different problems, they're interesting problems, and so we want to understand, you know, what are the mechanisms, um, both in theory and, you know, and kind of in principle, to deal with these problems, and then what are the ones that immune systems are using, and then there might be some hope on down the road that we could think about, um, you know, maybe biologically inspired um, mechanisms of strategic robust design, or perhaps we could look at what, uh, what, what's being done in computer science departments, and they'll give us hints about what the immune system's doing that we haven't thought to think about yet. Um, so, you know, zipping really quickly through a few of the kinds of things, just to generate plain, straight, old, ordinary robustness. Of course, redundancy is great. You have multiple safeguards, like in this climbing setup, and uh, that's going to give you some background protect. You know, that gives you multiple, you know, if this, basically, if any one of these pieces of protection fails, the system is still equalizing weight across the other anchors, and the other anchors are going to hold, right? Um, this, this happens a lot in, uh, in, in the sort of design and structure of the immune system. Um, you, there's this idea of distributed control, avoiding kind of centralized command. If there's some centralized shutoff switch that just turns off an immune response, then, and, and, and pathogens can get inside and steal your genes and send out your signals, you know, if there's just an off switch, pathogens are going to hit that. Same thing, you know. So, so avoiding centralized control is going is to help. Um, for strategically robust control, commitment mechanisms are often extremely useful. We, we might expect that uh, a lot of systems would use, uh, would use feedback control in order, to, in order to regulate a response. Um, as, so as you're mounting an immune response, you might expect tight feedback control there. And that's how all of the models in immunology looked at what was going on in the immune system. But when we looked closely at the data, that didn't fit very well. Turns out that's not at all what the immune system's doing as it mounts a response. It's monitoring very early, and then it's committing to a planned program that it can't be dissuaded from. There's a, it goes into this fail-safe mode. It commits and goes through. Um, and so you know, that, that ends up being useful to explain aspects of what goes on in the immune system. You, there are various mechanisms. You close off obvious vulnerabilities. Um, and one thing, you know, one thing that's really interesting in the immune system, you might say that uh, this is what I want to finish up with, is the immune system is incredibly complicated in terms of its control logic compared to other biological systems. This is a very, very basic schematic from a few years ago of some of the different types of immune cells, uh, and, the, and then in, written in between them um, are all the different uh, signaling molecules that they pass back and forth, and kind of over and over for any cell, any cell in the immune system to do anything, it sort of has to get uh, prodded by one cell, it has to get permission from another, it has to make a decision based on its own interactions with the pathogen, and then if some other condition is right, then it'll take an action. And of course that action might be, just be stimulating some other kind of cell. So the, the sort of cross-validation and regulation, you know, it's, I'm never going to take an order from, from Ed without getting a checksum from Tom Daniel. Um, and that's going to keep me, and that's, that's going to keep, you know, that's going to keep me out of trouble is the, is the hope. So, what I've gotten very interested in in, in, in in the last year or so, I've been wanting to figure out, you know, how do we think about this in a game theoretic context? Can we somehow um, encapsulate enough of the strategies, a rich enough strategy space to start to look at, 
at this kind of complexity and why it might be useful. And so lately with uh, Eric Chastain, who's here as a graduate student at, at Rutgers in computer science, I've been thinking about, um, about what I call defensive complexity and its role in antagonistic coevolution. The basic idea of this is that um, if you have an evolutionary arms race, such as that between host and pathogen, um, one way that a host can deal with a pathogen that evolves very, very rapidly is to be so complex and difficult to figure out that the pathogen can't learn how to steer it, right? The pathogen can't learn how to co-opt it where that learning presumably occurs through the process of evolution by natural selection. Now what Eric and I have done is uh, figured out a, a way to uh, kind of think of a very basic game theoretic game that lets us pull in some of the tools of game theory and merge those with some pop gen and some kind of CS type thinking and so on. And we just imagine a situation like this. We're going to look at an interaction between a controller and an adversary that's trying to screw up the controller. The controller is trying to process information. There's some kind of cue about the environment that comes into a sensor, part of the controller's body. The sensor transduces that cue into a set of signals. Those signals are filtered through some kind of control logic that processes them and generates a response. There's some ideal response that the, that the controller will, will produce to different Q inputs. Then there's an adversary, and what the adversary can do is tamper with the signals in order to try to alter the response and get a response that's better for the adversary instead of better for the signaler. The controller, now in, in game theory sense, the controller's strategy, the controller gets to choose a control logic. So we'll say, let's suppose, you know, the, the Q, that's part of the environment, the signals, that's evolved perceptual, or the sensor is some evolved perceptual apparatus, but the control logic, the actual mechanism for how that information processing operates is something that the, that, the, uh, that the controller gets to choose. The adversary for the adversary's part gets to choose a strategy for how to tamper with the signals, upregulate, downregulate each of the signals. And what we typically think about is we think about situations where, you know, much as with hosts and pathogens, um, the adversary evolves very fast. So we think about, you know, maybe I put a control system in place and now the adversary gets 100,000 generations of evolution by natural selection to try to crack it. So you're getting kind of you know, um, into kind of cryptography type thinking about values of complexity here. To do this, you know, in, in the natural selection domain, we sort of know what algorithms, what learning algorithms the pathogen's going to use. It's going to use evolution by natural selection. That's, that's how um, that's what's going to happen. And so the control logic itself, you know, the, the, our, the insight we need is that the control logic that the, that the controller chooses to put in place in, induces a fitness landscape for the pathogen. So the, so the, the, control, the, con, the control logic sets up some kind of um, um, ad adaptive topography on which the pathogen is going to evolve. And the question is, you know, can the controller choose adaptive topographies that are hard to evolve on? instead of ones that are easy to evolve on. We could think about a control logic that's, you know, we can think of ways to formalize what a control logic might be. Here's one that takes two, that takes two signals um, and, then, and then generates some kind of a response. And so a very simple control logic might, have, might be set up to have the following um, consequences for the pathogen. The idea would be that, uh, that if, if the pathogen downregulates uh, the second signal, or upregulates the first signal, this is S2 here, then that, that hurts the pathogen. If the pathogen, uh, or that is the adversary, if the pathogen upregulates S2 or, upreg or downregulates S1, that's going to help the pathogen. And if it manages to do both, both upregulate uh, S2 and downregulate S1, then that helps the pathogen a lot. And what this thing, of course, this sets up an adaptive landscape that's just a slope. A pathogen can evolve very quickly uphill on this slope and reach the Reach, reach its global maximum. So a pathogen's going to vary. That's not a complex control logic. The pathogen can very, very quickly learn uh, what to do on a control logic like that one. Here's one that's a little bit more complex. It has a few more logical operators um, per conditional, and it actually sets up sort of a checkerboard pattern for the pathogen to have to learn on. The pathogen starts out here. If the pathogen manipulates signal one by itself in isolation, then, then it's going to make things worse, whether it makes it bigger or smaller. If it manipulates signal one, two in isolation, it makes it worse, whether it makes it bigger or smaller. So any single move by the pathogen is actually harmful for the pathogen, right? Um, even if the pathogen finds something beneficial, that beneficial thing three times out of four is not the global maximum for the pathogen. 
And not only that, but it's far away, right? It, you've got to move through one of these fitness valleys, so to speak, to get there. So this is a much harder learning problem for the pathogen. It's going to be harder for natural selection in, in ways that we can quantify very formally using mathematical population genetics. It's going to take a much longer time for this pathogen to evolve to do bad things. This pathogen will end up sitting here on this no perturbation state for a very long time because it because every time it tries a perturbation, that'll be selected against. It'll get pushed back. And even if it does reach one of these peaks, it probably won't be the one that's best for it. So this is, a, this is an instance of defensive complexity, right? A more complex control logic is making it very, very hard for the pathogen to evolve effectively. And so what Eric and I have been able to prove, really what Eric has been able to prove, um, are some, some very nice theorems um, uh, about these, about this kind of game. And so, you know, sort of to summarize, and in my language rather than in yours, what Eric's found is that uh, it's possible in these kinds of games, it's possible for the control, the controller can, can craft control logics that are very, very hard for adversaries to learn to exploit by this algorithm of evolution by natural selection. And, and so by that I mean it's, it's, it's going to take you know, the, the, time to, it, the time to reach a fitness optimum is going to be super polynomial in the number of signals that are used in that control system. So we start going back looking at the immune system. We got 60 some um, interleukins, for example, that are involved. And if that you know, system is enough of a mess, the time it's going to take to learn to, to drive that the way the pathogen might be selected to can be super polynomial in that number of signals. It would be very, very hard for pathogens to evolve to do that. And so this gives us this uh, you know, possible explanation for why it is even though we should have an evolutionary arms race between hosts and pathogens with respect to exploiting the control logic, humans study immunology by studying mice that diverged 65 million years ago. And while their specific chemical epitopes in the immune systems are very similar, the fundamental control logic hasn't changed. Why is it we've got an arms race and no change in fundamental control logic? One possibility is that it's so bloody complex, pathogens haven't been able to crack it. And uh, that's, that's sort of a good place to wrap up. Um, the work I've talked about has been uh, collaboration with Eric and Michael and Rustam, and the whole thing is really somehow coming out of ideas that, 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 that John put into my head many years ago. So thank you. <laughs>